Hello, my geeks and nerds. It's Christy. And in the last lecture or the last episode, I don't know what it is on YouTube, of How to Social Science 201, we looked at qualitative research design. And we left off at the end before we got to a real example. And that's what I'm going to walk you through here in this last bit of the, the lecture. We're going to be examining my research that was funded by the British Academy in 2010. The study was also funded again in 2015. And if you've been on my channel a lot, you know I've talked about the study and we've got a, a YouTube channel where I, I blogged when we did our field research. Starting with an example just to kind of tie together the elements that I mentioned last time. I'm going to go through here an overview of the study and then some particulars of the study design. So the research design is what, as I said, is the overview of the entire plan of your research from beginning to end. And a research design will start with the overall aims. So I'm going to read this out and it's not the entire research design, but this at least gives you like the framework of what the research design would start with and what my research grant proposal started with. The aim of the Qualitative Election Study of Britain is to generate qualitative data to provide insights into the opinions of citizens on politicians, party leaders, political issues, perceptions of their own civic duty to vote, whether or not they felt political alienation from the process or institutions, and any of their political activism. And I was collecting that data both before and after the general election. The goal of this data collection was to allow analysis of the meaning that underlies people's political assessments. It's to uncover the sources of their value system, to make explicit the ways that people were reaching their judgments, the, the values that informed their political preferences, and also by being open to listening to what people said, the analysis could allow for the identification of new research themes. The study design talks about how you're going to collect the data in particular, how you're going to deal with your participants, how you're going to run the study, the numbers of them, all this kind of thing. So the research design, again, more overarching and broad. It looks in the totality of your scope of your research. And as I said in the last lecture, I use the phrase study design to talk about the specific data collection. So here is here the, what I basically gave in terms of information on my study design. The project would begin in March 2010 and the data would be collected by July, 20, uh, July of 2010. I was recruiting people in person. I also recruited people by email and snowballing and um, word of mouth as well. But each of the people who wanted to participate had to fill out a questionnaire with their demographic information. The reason for that was because I didn't want a group, focus group of all students or all women or all labor voters or you know really imbalanced. So I recruited more people than were invited to participate and that was the in person, in email and uh, snowballing sampling frames. A small incentive was offered to increase participation rates and the focus groups took place in the evenings to allow, and also on weekends, to allow full-time workers to participate. So understanding that people's time is valuable and especially for people who are poor, who basically could be doing better things with their time than giving it away for free to some researcher, I recognize that people's time is valuable and if you want to incentivize people to participate then you need to compensate them for that and in my budget i offered them 25 pounds for 90 minute focus groups those who were selected to participate were provided with written information to explain what informed consent was and the procedures used to ensure their anonymity I had an interview schedule with the questions that I was going to be asking each group but it was semi-structured that allowed me the flexibility to take a question into an interesting area if the group went there, but also it was consistent enough across groups to be able to compare the data in England, Scotland, and Wales pre and post. And if I had interest in talking to people after the election, I just mentioned that I wanted the ability to do follow-up phone interviews. Another part of the study design is that it was a, a two-way data collection project. So we had the pre-election views and then we invited people for back, I, I invited people back in 2010, we in 2015, I invited people back in the post to follow up with them. So people in the pre were always invited to participate in the post. And the aim of this was to get people's perceptions of the election results, talk about the national turnout rates and attitudes toward the newly elected governments. Most, if you think about most polling surveys, they don't take 
polls about people's preferences of the election after the election's been done. But from a qualitative point of view, I was interested in how people explained their vote choice to themselves, what were the last minute influences, how did they perceive the election, how did they perceive the new government. All of the stuff was still important, and especially when you have someone saying something at time point A, and you want to see if they actually followed through with it, you need to talk to them again. And that's why there was the pre-post element to the study. I had already identified forms of analysis that shaped the form of the questions that I wanted to pose to people, narrative analysis, thematic analysis, content analysis, as well as grounded theory was applied to the data to investigate the topics and the themes mentioned above. That's the bit about the study design. And again, the study design is the particulars around the people that you're going to be talking to, protecting their anonymity, their, your ethical requirements, how you're going to recruit them, how you're going to compensate them, how, wh what you're going to do with your data, uh, what kind of questions you're going to ask. All of that stuff, of course, has to be done before you go into the field. And that's why research design is so vital in any scientific um, project. An element of qualitative research that is rather unique is this idea of a research diary. And the research diary is the record of the researcher's involvement in their own projects. It contains information about the researcher, what the researcher does, the process of research, and it complements the data yielded by the research methodology. We've talked about the fact that qualitative research is iterative. And in iterative research, you have to adapt and make changes and your thinking through your concepts and revising things. Documenting that process then makes it easier for other people to follow your thinking and follow your reasoning as you've moved through your project. And that's why research diaries aren't important in quantitative research, because you're doing deductive hypothesis testing. Whereas with inductive data, you're collecting data, looking for patterns, thinking about it, going to the literature, thinking about it some more, reformulating your question, going back to the data. That's one of the ways that you can do it. And if that's the case, you have to document that process, not just the data itself. Here are Hughes's reasons for keeping a research diary. It generates a history of the project, your thinking, and the research process. It provides material for your own reflection. It provides data on the research process itself, and you can record the developments of your research skills in this research diary as well. And in my notes, I also find it very helpful as a, a, a way to work out your concept, ideas, and your research question, and it can be a place to brainstorm. What goes into a research diary? A summary of what happened each day you work on the project. And this is particularly important for people who do ethnographic research, people who go and embed themselves, let's say, in an activist community or into um, you know, a, a business setting and watch people to try to understand the culture of that business. So uh, research diaries in particular are very, very helpful for ethnographic research. Another thing that can go into your research diary are stories of your of conversations, discussions, interviews, your planning sessions, and so on with your peers and teachers and supervisors. You can keep a note of your questions and topics for further study or investigation, your guesses, hunches, thoughts, and dreams. You can map things out, mind maps, or write diagrams. You can put in there just random observations, reflections on what you saw. You can even put in reflections on what you've thinking about what you've thought about having read through the diary and see where you've come from the beginning of your project to whatever point you're in. And you can then also use it for plans for future action or research. Observation and research plans will be written up in your field notes, progress reports, and research proposals. If you put into the diary the ideas that they occur to you as you are being they are being developed by you, it'll be fresher than trying to just remember it. And you can also include their reflections on your practices, performance, behaviors, feelings, and actions as a researcher. These can also later be used in your analysis to reflect on where you were in the process or what had affected you about what you had seen. And so your research diary doesn't have to be published, it's your research diary, but you might find that you've gone on a journey and seen your own view on something become more mature or in depth. And so looking at that process of understanding might be a useful piece of information to add to your research to talk about the impact of conducting the research on your understanding of the concept. And your readers might really benefit from that. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Christy. I'm Aizia. And we are doing the Qualitative Election Study of Britain, Cardiff 
edition. <laughs> so we get to report our first Cardiff-based vlog for our focus group research. And last night we did the second of the televised, well, we call them debates. The third one's not going to be a debate, but the leaders' appearances on television. And Adzia ran the group last night in the first half of it before the debates. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to have a little discussion about the challenges and other things that happened around Cardiff how the group went before the debates, how we thought people were reacting to and working on their data collection during the debates, and what they thought about how it went. Yeah, so then uh, people turned up uh, at yesterday's focus group well in time. In fact, I started 10 minutes before yeah. the uh, scheduled time. You got an extra minutes of basically ten free minutes of data collection. Yeah, that was brilliant. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, and I could. Uh, I think because of those ten minutes, the first question that we asked, I could spend a little bit more time probing everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would have had to rush through it. In any case, you were worried. I was. I was not going to finish in time. Because <laughs> I was sat there and I knew uh, because I was. Um, so we had the student assistant. The room to get to the room was quite complicated, and it was getting to be about the time where people would start arriving. So we sent the student assistant to kind of go and greet people at the door and give them directions and then I would stand outside the hallway there's a really long hallway and I would sort of stand at the end of it and be like are you looking for the focus group yep this way and so when um, I had gone to fetch the student because he didn't know everybody had arrived you had already started and it was 10 to 10 to 7 yes and I was like oh this is great we get like an extra 10 minutes of of, of data collection and then Adzia asked that question and it lasted till quarter after seven mm -hmm. <laughs> I was sitting on the other side just freaking out mm -hmm. so I'm like she's got this question to get through and she's got the leaders exercise and this and this and like there's not gonna be enough time there's not gonna be <laughs> enough time but I was wrong she totally managed her time managed to squeeze every drop out of people and we had um, enough time to have a comfort break but then also set up the students with the social media experiment and get the room set up for people to do the leaders reports and to hand out the leaders reports before the actual debate started so it worked out in terms of timing really well but you felt the whole time like you had it under control yeah I felt like I, I, there were like I was mentioning it this morning um, there was some things coming out from the participants which I felt was very useful for us in the terms of in terms of richness of the data and I, I was trying to walk that line of not stopping them before they give you that gem of a of insight, uh, but not letting them ramble too too <laughs> long because that's not going to be helpful. Um, so trying to find that balance and making sure that everybody had that input um, as well, um, because I think the first question that we asked them was, is one that is going to be quite relevant for us mm -hmm. for this election? Yeah, um, and and we had all most mostly undecided mm -hmm. or at least non-partisans in the group, um, and getting insight into what. Um, is driving them to make up their mind was something that I thought would yeah. um, set the tone for the rest of the focus group. And by way of explanation, we actually have a sort of a, a recommended time length to make sure that the moderator, whoever's running it, can kind of peg when they start and get a sense of how long the question's been going on and then move on to the next question so you make sure you give every question enough time. And that question had been listed for like 10 minutes? 15. 15 minutes, yeah. And you went for 25. Yeah. And that's why I was freaking yeah. out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't just like I thought she was, you know, it was like, we're on a time thing, she's gone over, but she totally had it under control. In terms of our methodological approach, what we wanted to do, Roger Scully was quite interested in this nexus of people voting for parties at different levels, at the council level, at the assembly level, and at the Westminster. And that was the question that you spent a lot of time kind of pulling out. And maybe, do you want to talk a little bit theoretically about why that was important and well I think at the end of the day uh, what we are interested in is um, what drives people to make a particular choice in terms of they were, so why do they vote the way they do um, and Roger was interested in trying to find out if there are different drivers at different levels of government uh, at different levels of elections um, so I, um, I I wanted to make sure that we give him and give ourselves enough of uh, data to be able to answer that question and to be able to see if there are any differences so um, is it policy is it party is it candidate 
that drives people's decisions at each level or are there differences? So it's candidate at one level and policy at another and party at a third or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, that's where I'm yeah. thinking about it. And yeah, do you want to just kind of then give a summary about how you felt like the first half went? Very well. Um, yeah, the participants were, were generally really, really good. Um, quite a couple of participants who were very much engaged in the whole process and who gave us quite thoughtful responses. Uh, the group as a whole worked really well. There was not anyone who wanted to dominate or mm -hmm. was um, extremely outspoken or, or in the sense of you know ha inhibiting other people from speaking. So uh, and it was a small group. It was about six people around the table. So in that sense, it was quite intimate as well. Um, yeah, I, I thought that the rapport between the uh, members of the group was quite good, mm -hmm. a, a good feel for it. Yeah. yeah, and they were kind of politically aligned. I mean, it's Wales, so it tends to be, or at least the, the where the constituencies that we were drawing from, we didn't draw from any that had sort of like a natural conservative base. So I don't, did anyone say that they, someone said they had considered voting or would consider voting conservative or had voted conservative in the past. But I think that there was more of like less of the UKIP side of sort of the political spectrum. Um, and so they tended to have very similar values and critiques and sort of sided. And they had differences, like they disagreed on like later on on um, Natalie Bennett's performance mm. to some degree. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that. But generally they were they had a rapport going on because, yeah. Mm. I mean, I think the other thing that was very interesting was that they were, um, there were some things, like you said, like for example, Natalie Bennett's performance, uh, where people quite uh, were quite um, vociferous about their disagreement, mm -hmm. but not in a way that would make somebody else feel um, that their opinion was being devalued or that their opinion was wrong. So not attaching mm -hmm. any value labels. They were more like, I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. This is what I think. Um, but yeah, that, that's just me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we try to encourage that, sort of let people willing, willing to step up and say, oh, I don't really see it like that. From my perspective, it looks like this kind of language um, to get a variety of viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we had actually like, you know, two people who basically were in similar political wavelengths, um, having a bit of a back and forth about what debate should be about. Should mm -hmm. they be very stage managed and pre-prepared or should they be quite spontaneous? And it was a little bit off the topic, but it was an interesting exchange back and forth and it was quite respectful and I think they kind of both ended up realizing that they agreed, they just kind of were coming at it from, from different like uh, perspectives, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of how they were approaching what was important. Right, that is the end. This is a really, really short one. So um, apologies if you were expecting a longer one, but the last time I made the mistake of saying that we were gonna be doing uh, the quants data um, lecture next, and that wasn't true. It was gonna be, I'm doing the quants one now that we've finished up the qual one. So this is part two of the qual lecture, wrapping up. Next time we're gonna be back with the quant side, and that's gonna be in How to Social Science 202. For, so look for that separate series very shortly here on YouTube. And all that's left to be said then, to you, my fellow geeks and nerds, is that I've been Christy, you've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention. We'll see you soon.